Looks like you've uh, got your homework 13 here. Any more submissions for that? Homework 13. Now, homework 14 will be due <coughs> in 48 hours from now. You've got the handout problem and uh, this other one from the book. And they're both similar. We'll work a couple of examples today that I think will make that really a straightforward exercise. Uh, as I've mentioned before, our final is on Tuesday the 6th. It's going to be comprehensive just because it's kind of impossible for it not to be. Um, but there will be emphasis on the material since the second midterm, meaning um, gradually varying flow, rapidly varying flow, and the uh, sewer design and channel design stuff that we're going to be doing today and next, next time. Uh, I'll give you the equation sheet on Thursday, and uh, you won't be able to bring an additional equation sheet. Just that the one that I'm going to provide is what you'll have. And um, I may also, like in an equation, there may be like a graph or something uh, that could be referenced. And so you won't need to bring anything but your calculator, computer, and writing instruments for the final exam. And we'll talk about the equation sheet in class on Thursday. So today we're going to be talking about sewer design and a word of caution. If you ever go into an environmental engineering or sewer design, don't tell family members because they're going to hold on to that. They're going to latch on to that one fact and they're going to think that's all you do. You know, even if your job includes a million different things, they're going to get it in their brain that you deal with sewers. And so you got to find some other way to describe it. I made that mistake with my uncle, and he still thinks that all I do is analyze human waste. So uh, there's, there's no going back on that. So we're going to be talking about sewer design today. It's really glamorous. That's why I leave it for the end of the semester, sort of go out with a bang. Um, so <coughs> um, a couple of terminology items, actually, before we get into any problem-solving type stuff. The purpose of a sanitary sewer is just to transport wastewater. And even though there are other constituents in wastewater besides water, the fluid properties of sewage are almost identical to those of uh, ordinary water. And so, you know, the density of water is still 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. The unit weight is still 9810 newtons per cubic meter. Uh, there are solids, and there are actually um, dissolved solids and suspended solids, both, that have to be accounted for. But really, that comes into play more in the uh, water and wastewater side of things. And you'll take that course next fall. As far as the, um, the, uh, the hydraulic properties, we don't have to really make a lot of adjustments for the fact that it's wastewater. Um, the pipes are buried, and the main objective in a sanitary sewer is to try and convey the water without having to pressurize the pipe. And so it's an open channel in spite of the fact that it's a pipe. And so far in the course, we've had two very distinct things. When we've had water flowing through pipes, it's because it was pressurized flow. And so we called that closed conduit flow or, or pipe flow. And then open channel flow, usually we were drawing a trapezoidal channel or a rectangular channel. And so here, it's conveyed through a pipe for a couple of reasons that we'll get into in a minute. But it's also not pressurized. And so the pipe has to be going downhill to actually convey the flow. And the reason why we use an enclosed pipe is, number one, because it makes sense to bury the sewage lines. You don't want them, you don't want the sewage running in the gutter, although there are some places in the world where, where they do that. They have um, you know, sewage running through the gutters, and that's pretty unpleasant for obvious reasons. But uh, the reason why we don't pressurize these pipes is that if it's under pressure, then there's the risk that it could rupture and contaminate groundwater supplies. Um, and, uh, and also, if you pressurize the pipe, you're having to pay for electricity, and so pumping costs. And where a town is built, ordinarily, most cities are next to water. You know, all of the big cities in the world are near the ocean or near a river. There are very, very few exceptions to that. And so if you have a town, and you know, here's a water body, whether it's a, uh, a river or a lake or something. So here's the town. And uh, not much of a foundation there, but you get the idea. There's a bunch of buildings and houses. And so the water flows down towards the ultimate receiving body. It's a stream or a river. 
the water goes into whatever that is. In our case, it's the Ohio River, which also happens to be our drinking water source. And don't think about that too much. Actually, it's not, a, it's not a problem because the wastewater is discharged downstream of our inlet, right? The, the inlet is in Guyandot. I don't know if you've ever seen that, just right off of Route 2. And our discharge is, um, I think, just on the west side, not too far into the west side, but it's downstream. Of course, there are plenty of towns upstream of us, but the water has long enough and it's treated to a standard that the quality is fine and there aren't any risks. But the, uh, the main point is that the towns are collected to these sewer lines with laterals and the water flows by gravity. Um, there are some communities where what happens if, you know, there's a hill here and so there's a few buildings how do they get their wastewater over to the lake? And so it'll still be going downhill for a ways, but then they'll have to have what's called a lift station. And so the, uh, the wastewater would be pressurized with the pump, and there would be like a wet well here. There would sort of be a reservoir that the wastewater fills up, and as soon as the water level gets to a certain elevation, the pump would kick on, and it would push the water through this pressurized section of pipe and then it would enter the gravity flow network and go the rest of the way down to the distribution center. Um, the cost of pumping water in wastewater is one of the main expenses of treating it. And so whenever we can avoid having pressurized flow, then uh, that's a very good thing for a town if you can have good gravity flow. There are service connections, which are the laterals that come into the, the main sewer line. And in most towns, the laterals that come in from houses on either side of the sewer pipe are owned by the, uh, the landowner, or um, at least from the property line to the owner's house is owned by the landowner. And so if you have a street, then the sewer will usually be buried in the center of it, and it'll accept sewage from houses on either side, houses and businesses on either side of the street. Uh, those connections that come into the sewer line can very easily become clogged with uh, tree roots that'll break into the laterals um, and debris that people uh, flush down the toilet or grease can cause conditions where there's a lot of accumulation of uh, sticky materials and, um, and so that's one of the reasons why cities are anxious not to own everything from the drain to the wastewater treatment plant is a lot of the maintenance issues happen on people's private property. And so if you've got a sewer lateral that's clogged with tree roots and they're your trees and the sewer line is on your property, typically that's the responsibility of the homeowner to maintain that. Um, these are called manholes that the top of the street, and I'm sure everybody's heard that, it's a sexist term, right? It should be called person holes, not manholes. Although Maybe you've got to be as stupid as a man to climb down into a manhole and get into the sewer, but uh, that's what historically they're called manholes. And uh, ordinarily, they'll have vents on there because as the water level rises and falls, um, there is gas inside of the sewer that has to be displaced. And if you have, especially in a combined sewer like we have here in Huntington, where both the sewage and rainwater goes through the same pipe, when it rains really hard and quickly, like it was this morning, the pipes can be basically almost dry, and then suddenly a huge wave of water will come through. And so those gases have to be able to vent through the top of the manhole, or else they would vent into people's lateral collect, uh, connections. And so imagine um, if all of a sudden a bunch of air started coming out of your toilet, especially in basements, can be vulnerable to that. And so. Uh, although it lets rainwater in, those little holes on top of manholes, that's the reason why they have those vents there is so that the gases that are inside of this pipe can, uh, can escape as the pipe suddenly fills. Sewer pipes are around for a really long time and here in Huntington is a perfect example of that. We've got plenty of sewer pipes in the city of Huntington that are more than 100 years old. And some of them are so old that they're made out of really um, um, anachronistic uh, pipe materials like uh, vitrified clay, things that people haven't made, you, there haven't been clay pipes put in the ground for more than 50 years in this area, but there are still plenty of them in service just because 
there are parts of Huntington that haven't had new sewer pipes put in for a really long time. So when you design a sewer network, you have to keep into account not only how much water is going to go into it now, but 50 years in the future or 100 years in the future. Or the safest way to think about it is if all of the land that is upstream of this sewer pipe was put into service, you know, if, if all of the uh, raw land was they chop down the timber and put a bunch of houses on it, which is what usually happens, then uh, how much sewage demand would there be for the pipe that's being put in? So demand estimation is a really important part of sizing pipe networks, and it's one where you can get into trouble really quickly if you under-design how much uh, demand there's going to be for the space in the sewer. In addition to having to plan for the future, you know, trying to estimate what are the flows going to be 50 years from now, it's also complicated by the fact that there's temporal distribution during the day. And everybody in here is already familiar with our peaking factor chart that says water use is at midnight low and declines through the middle of the night and then has a morning bump and then has an evening surge and goes back to normal. And so here's the 12 a.m. to noon and back to midnight cycle. So this is water use, is how you've seen it before, but it's also water discharge because people in a house, the water that they use, the vast majority of that water ends up going down the drain. If you're taking a shower, you're using the water and discharging it almost simultaneously. Washing clothes, there's a very short delay between water use and water discharge. Um, here in the eastern United States, very few people have to irrigate their grass, and so there's a close association between water use and water discharge. Out in the western United States, people uh, often will use drinking and irrigation water to uh, water the lawn in their yard, and so the, the tie between water use and water discharge isn't quite as tight as it is here. But daily flow variations is what you have to keep into, uh, keep into account when you're sizing the pipe, is that it's not just the average daily flow. If if you size the pipe for the average daily flow, then that means 50% of the day the pipe is going to be undersized. And that would be really a horrible, horrible uh, failure criteria if the, if the pipe failed 50% of the time. So you want to design it for the peak flow 50 years in the future. Uh, the other issues to keep into account when you're sizing the pipe network are what's sometimes called informally I and I. The two I's are infiltration and inflow. Infiltration is when there's a cracked pipe, or maybe there are joints between pipes that allow seepage of um, groundwater to get into the sewer network. So if we go back to this cross section, most likely this pipe is going to be buried underneath the water table. Now here in Huntington, if you go down, just a couple of feet, depending on the season, you get to the water table, meaning that all of the voids in the soil are fully saturated with water. Well, if your pipe network is five, six feet underground, then that means any crack in the pipe, if there's just, you know, if it's an old concrete pipe that's cracked because maybe the gravel that it was laid out on wasn't quite level over time, as the uh, soil presses down, a crack will occur in that pipe, and so groundwater is going to seep into the pipe if it's cracked. Or where the pipes come together, if the rubber gasket that joins the two pipes has decayed over time, and then there's going to be a space there, then what we call infiltration is referring to groundwater that seeps into those poorly constructed joints and into the pipe breaks over time. And this is relatively constant because the groundwater elevation varies seasonally, but it doesn't have huge surges in response to a storm event. On the other hand, the other eye, inflow, is talking about surface water getting into the pipe network. And so when you see pictures of, uh, here's a picture, of a roof drain, a commercial roof drain, a business, if you look around Huntington, you'll notice that there are these pipes that go from the roof just mysteriously down into the parking lot. And you wonder, well, wow, where is that water going? It ends up in the pipe network that in, in Huntington, most places it's a combined sewer, so all of the water off of the roof has to go be treated as though it's sewage. And so that is inflow. And 
most of the connections here are not illegal connections. Most of the hun uh, connections in Huntington, they're, you know, they're old enough, they've been grandfathered in, and they just say, we wish you'd disconnect it, but they're not legal. Business owners aren't legally obligated to disconnect. There are some homeowners who are starting to just sort of as a uh, goodwill gesture and wanting to do the eco-friendly thing because for every gallon of water that gets down to the wastewater treatment plant, uh, that is increasing the cost and the electricity consumption and it's very expensive. It, it's not like you're diluting the wastewater so it's making it less of a problem. The, the cost of wastewater treatment depends primarily on its volume, not on its concentration. So inflow does vary with storm events. Obviously, if a big storm comes through, then you're going to see a lot more runoff from roof drains getting into the pipe network. And so um, those two factors can have, you know, they may be double the flows that are going to be the service connection flows. Um, and in some places, you know, Manila in the Philippines is notorious for both infiltration and inflow. And I&I and I accounts for more than 90% of the flow going through the pipe network in the Philippines. How do you determine if you're having infiltration? Um, that's a good question. Um, so you know you've got infiltration if the strength of the wastewater is relatively low because um, there is a way to measure how much waste is in wastewater. It's something called BOD, and you'll learn all about it next fall in water and wastewater treatment. And so if you've got a relatively, they call it a weak sewage, and low strength, not much waste, then that might be an indicator that there's infiltration. Um, or they, they do inspections. And this picture on the left is actually a camera, they sometimes have them on long fiber optic cables and sometimes they've actually got these little remote control cars that they'll drive through the sewer. You can see water coming in here. It's like a little waterfall. And uh, they visually inspect pipes probably every couple of years they'll get through the entire network, more often on some lines. All right, so what this table illustrates is uh, different cities and how they vary in what they tell designers to assume for how much water uh, to plan on going through the, the pipe network. So uh, oftentimes the engineer is going to be designing with a, a government mandated flow estimate per person. Now, they may not tell you exactly how many people are going to be in the developed area, but let's say, for example, in Milwaukee. Milwaukee is taking a very conservative approach here, and they're saying you should assume that every person is going to contribute 1,000 liters of wastewater per day to the, to the uh, sewage network, plus additional flow for infiltration and inflow. So that's a really conservative estimate. And sort of on the low end of the scale, Berkeley, California just says that you should assume 350 liters per person per day. You can see that there are other sort of comments along the way. You know, Des Moines has a specified peaking factor that you're supposed to use based on population. Some of the other ones that don't have a specific peaking factor, there are empirical estimations that you can use. Um, remember, these are average daily flow rates, and if you design the pipe just for the average daily flow rate, then it's going to fail for 50% of the day. So um, it's kind of interesting that often it is uh, code. Code doesn't come into design for hydraulics um, as often it does in some other fields, like in structural design, you know, just going by the code. That, that's what governs design a lot more often than we see that in hydraulics. But here's an instance where a municipal code does sometimes influence what we do. Um, and so here is a table of typical population densities. And if you are to be putting in a multi-story apartment, for example, in an urban center that's very highly uh, densely populated, you may assume that there's going to be 2,500 people per hectare there. Whereas in the case of a very large lot, single family homes with large lots, the population density may be as uh, low as five to seven people per hectare. 
So if you know what they call the sewer shed, if you know the area of land that is intended to drain into a certain sewer trunk line, and you know the area of that sewer shed, and make an estimate on population density, then you can bounce that estimated population density off of a table like this to find out the flow rate. Uh, this, you know, it's just a matter of interpretation, the population density. Uh, I think you can make arguments. I don't think there is the same um, mandated population densities as there are these mandated flow rates. I think it, it, it varies based on the project that you're doing. But yeah, hectare isn't a very common unit of area in the United States. That's true. Now, what we've just talked about is residential connections. Uh, this table summarizes how wastewater capacity is estimated for commercial and industrial connections like hospitals, um, schools, and so on. And uh, usually that is based on a land area rather than on a, um, on a specific use basis. You know, here's an exception. In Grand Rapids, they have it broken down in sort of a similar way to what you did in the design project. But there are a lot of other cities that just say in commercial areas you should assume the generation of wastewater will be based on the area of that commercial area, commercial versus industrial. Now one little asterisk mention about this is that there are some industrial facilities that will have their own wastewater treatment. So a food processing plant or a metals processing facility Oftentimes, their wastewater would be so concentrated and strong that it would overwhelm the city's wastewater treatment network. And so they have to have sort of their own pretreatment, or in some cases, they have their own uh, full-scale wastewater treatment plant. And so they won't generate any wastewater into the pipe network if they've got their own sewage system. They had their own wastewater treatment. Yeah, another place where they very often will have their own wastewater treatment is uh, feedlots, you know, animal feedlots where they get all the cows together before they um, turn it into hamburger. Um, it, because the, the waste is so strong, it, when it rains on a feedlot, that, that waste is so powerful that it would just completely overwhelm any municipal sewer network. And so they usually have their own treatment plants there. So you need to exclude that if it's going to be the case. Uh, okay, so I and I and peaking factors. There are some ways that we can estimate those, you know, the, there's the number of people and how much wastewater they're going to be generating, but then also um, these other factors. How deep the sewer is going to be buried may influence your I and I. If you have good contractors who are going to make sure that the gravel underneath the pipe is nice and flat, that can reduce instances of cracking. But really, you know, what to use for that has to be determined by looking at adjacent communities. You need to go, you know, if you're designing a pipe network in Barbersville, you go to St. Albans and do a study on INI there. Or most likely, most cities would already know how much INI they've got. They'll have studies like that. And so finding out the typical values for the materials that are commonly used in this area and the construction standards that are typical for this area. Does that infiltration ever go up first? Like if your pipe is full, would it seep into yeah. the water? Yeah. I guess that's a big problem. That's a, that's a huge <laughs> problem. Yeah. And, and so that, Zach makes a good point, is think about if the, uh, if the sewage gets out of the pipe. That, that can contaminate the groundwater. And, uh, and so typically, water pipelines, to try and help avoid that issue or, or the full negative impact that could arise from that, is when there's a crossing of a sewage pipe and a water pipe, they usually will insist that the water pipe cross above the sewage pipe so that if there is leakage, then the waste is draining down um, because there can be cracks in water pipes too. Uh, the water main that runs along my road, I think, has had, it's broke like three times in the last 18 months. And so, um, yeah, and, and it seems to always break just right by where some new house got built. 
and they've got a septic system right up uphill of the brake. So I'm sure I'm drinking all sorts of nasties, but not sick yet. Here are the peaking factors that uh, empirically, if there isn't a prescribed approach for trying to find out how the flow rate is going to vary, then uh, one approach, if you want to find the peak flow rate relative to the average daily flow rate, the thinking here is that if you know the population in thousands, the bigger the town, the less the peaking rate is going to be. So that's the impact of this being in the denominator, is that if you have a very large population, that will reduce the peaking factor. And the reason why is that when you have a large population, you have greater variety in what time people are doing things. But probably more importantly is that the town is spread out. So that even if everyone flushes their toilet at 8 o'clock when some TV show is finished, it takes a different time for that wastewater to travel into the pipe network. And so there's sort of a, they call it a routing effect, the time delay that it takes for uh, water to flow through a network. And so uh, this population estimate and over here, it's sort of the, uh, the same thing, but we're talking about a minimum flow now. The larger the town, the less impact, the less difference there's going to be between the minimum and the average flow rate. Then it, the, the small towns are the ones that suffer from these uh, wild swings in the peak and the minimum flow rates compared to the average. And we'll have an example where we try these equations out. In fact, here it is. Um, I'd like you to estimate, if you've got a condominium development, a picture of condominium there, we've got a 17.5 hectare community and uh, we're mandated to use a wastewater generation rate of 350 liters per day per person. So estimate the peak and minimum wastewater flow rates in terms of cubic meters per day. A condominium would be considered small lots to family. You can see from the picture there that uh, each structure actually has two separate front doors, two separate driveways. And so we're assuming a population density of 125 people per hectare. And uh, if we've got 17.5 hectares under development and 350 liters per person per day, that means the average daily flow rate is going to be 765,000 liters per day. So that's 765 cubic meters per day of wastewater that's going to be generated. That's the average daily flow rate. The peak flow rate is going to be that average daily flow rate multiplied by the peaking factor. Now remember, P should be the population in thousands. And uh, the population in thousands, we've got 2.18 thousand people. So the peaking factor multiplied by the average daily flow rate means the peak flow rate is going to be 36.55 cubic meters per day. Now, it's a little bit confusing because this is all happening on the same day, but our flow rate is in cubic meters per day. And so we could find out how many liters per second that would be, and that maybe would make more sense. But remember that this 765 cubic meters per day is the average daily flow rate. And so that would be this value here in the middle, we're saying is 765 cubic meters per day. We're saying that the peak flow rate, we estimate the peak flow rate is going to be 36.55 cubic meters per day. And then the low flow rate, probably here in the middle of the night, 173 cubic meters per day. That's nonlinear, the relationship between peak flow rate and uh, the population. And, you know, this is just strictly empirical. There's no definitive fundamental relationship between population and peak values. This is just sort of an average that's been observed. And in a town that's more closely packed, maybe because of geography, you know, if you think of uh, Morgantown, for example, where it's so steep and hilly that people sort of have to 
live closer together than they might in the middle of Kansas, where it's flat and people spread out more, or you know, even the most spread out city in America, I think, is Phoenix. So you know, things are really sprawled in Phoenix. So maybe these wouldn't work well for those exceptional cities. But that just gives you an idea of how sometimes in wastewater generation studies, we use population as an indicator of what the peak values might be. All right. Well, let's change gears a little bit. We've been talking about demand estimation, basically. What about pipe sizing? So this is headed on the track of how big should the pipe be once you know how many people there are going to be. Okay. As I mentioned, the pipe isn't flowing full. In fact, we get a little bit nervous as hydraulic designers when the uh, sewage pipe gets full because when the sewage pipe, pipe gets full, that means it's backing up somewhere. You know, if it's full, the place that you're measuring it, that means that either upstream or downstream, uh, it's beyond capacity, and they sometimes call that surcharged. When the pipe that's supposed to be flowing by gravity and not ever be full, when it is full, they call it surcharged or pressurized. And so, if the pipe is pressurized, that means it starts going out of the laterals instead of water coming in from the laterals. Um, so this is showing the geometry of a partially full pipe. The water depth, we can call that Y or we can call it H. But a really important thing to note is that the angle with the center of the pipe and the water surface, here you can see we're designating that as theta. And we'll measure theta in terms of radians. Excuse me. Sneeze or not. Oh, OK. False alarm. Uh, the top width of the water inside of the pipe can be measured as a function of the uh, pipe radius <coughs> in radians. So D, which is the overall pipe diameter, times the sine of the pipe angle will give you the top width. Um, you can find the relationship between the pipe size D and the angle and H, using this relationship, we'll apply each of these in a minute. Uh, the cross-sectional area for a partially full pipe also is a function of the radius, and so is the wetted perimeter, P. So it actually gets very complicated to solve the geometry of partially full pipes. Um, and complicating matters even further is the fact that the roughness value varies as the flow depth increases and decreases. And so let's just briefly, before we move any further in the presentation, let's talk about that, why that might be. Think about a pipe, and uh, the manufacturer doesn't know how full that pipe's going to be. You know, and so they can't tell you anything more informative than what's the end value when that pipe is full. So if a manufacturer said this has an end value of 0 0.014, they're talking about when the water's all the way to the top. Why do you think the end value might be different when this is when it's full? What about when the water level's down here? Why isn't it going to be the same end value? What do you mean? Go into more detail. All right, so when it's full, your wetted perimeter is the entire circumference of the pipe. That's true. And so when the water level's down here, what's our wetted surface? You know, it's this amount. Well, what's really important in flow capacity is the relationship between cross-sectional area and wetted perimeter. Remember, hydraulic radius is area divided by wetted perimeter. And so think about when, when the pipe's all the way full, you know, yeah, you've got a big wetted perimeter because you've got to go all the way around. But you, you also have a very big area. So think about when it's this full. You have much less flow area, but still a fair amount of wetted perimeter. And so there's a differing relationship between as the water level increases and decreases, you're having uh, a change in both the area and the wetted perimeter, but they don't change at the same rate, and that affects the end value. And so a caution I'm going to give you at the beginning is that as we solve these partially full pipes, 
we're going to have to keep in mind that if we use Manning's equation, we have to correct Manning's equation, or we have to correct the end value. We have to make some sort of a correction because solving for what the capacity of a full pipe might be is a completely different problem than solving for the capacity of a partially full pipe. Would the, does the end value change? It gets bigger. It bigger, yeah, because think about it, it's more rough. I would think that if that was the Yeah, so think of it this way, is, you know, um, more of the flow is close to the surface that's causing resistance, right? We've always thought about this pipe as because of the no-slip condition, that it's, it, the, the pipe is pushing and resisting the water. And so as the depth goes down, all of this water is very close to that wetted perimeter where the resistance is imparted. And so the effectiveness is that the end value increases. And then so if the end value is increasing, then that's going to uh, provide more resistance to flow. What's best? What's best is full. Well, actually, that's not true. That's a really interesting question because what's best is almost full. Because think of it this way. Right, yeah. If you can get it up here, then you've got most of the area, but you avoid all of that wetted perimeter. And so your capacity at about 90% depth, 95% depth, is actually larger than the full pipe capacity. Kind of interesting that, that when it gets that little bit deeper, then all of a sudden you've got more wetted perimeter. The, the increase in flow area capacity, you know, the cross-sectional area went up, but the effect of that is more than outweighed by the additional wetted perimeter and resistance that you get from that contact. And there's a graph that illustrates that pr uh, principle. So if you insert these expressions for wetted perimeter and cross-sectional area into Manning's equation. So here's ordinary Manning's equation. And what, do we, what depth do we solve for when we use Manning's equation? Normal depth, not the critical depth, not the, uh, not the uh, any other depth, the normal depth. <laughs> I couldn't think of another kind of depth. <laughs> not, yeah, not the abnormal depth, it's the normal depth. So, uh, not the depth of a hydraulic jump, just the normal depth. If you insert the formulas for area and wetted perimeter into Manning's equation, then this is what it looks like as a function of the radius, where again, radians. You have to be in radian mode. And in my calculator, I have to go into the settings and take it out of degree mode and put it into radians mode for the sine of some angle to make any sense. Or I need to make the conversion before I do the calculation. So here I'm just giving you, on the left, the note that you have to either adjust the N value or you have to correct for the Q versus the Q full. And uh, we'll do both of those things in the example we're working. You know, either approach. I'll show you how to adjust using either approach. Um, and so the design procedure is if you have a certain flow rate that you have to accommodate, you know, you did your demand estimation and you find out that you're going to need to convey a capacity of 3655 cubic meters per day. So that's the flow rate. And you know the slope of the pipe because you know uh, the slope of your town. Or you know that you're going to be burying at a certain depth and uh, you're going to go to a pump station and that'll increase it and lift it for a while, then it'll go sloped again. So you, you know the slope will be given or designed the end value from the manufacturer of whatever pipe you're using, um, then there's this relationship between solving for the diameter of the pipe that's needed and then finding what the, um, the angle is going to be. And th the angle basically tells you the depth of flow. So in some ways, it's an iterative process. All right, so... Le mm -hmm. Was it possible for... Yeah. Hold the water back when it's going mm -hmm. down yeah. And uh, that is a real problem. Zach asks an important question, and that is, what about at the beginning of your 50-year lifespan, right? 
Uh, we, we've sized a pipe for 50 years in the future. Okay, so most of the development isn't built yet. There's very few people flushing the toilets. And at night, there's essentially nobody flushing the toilet. And so, you know, the water level's all the way down here. So Zach's thinking in terms of there's really a lot of roughness. What's going to happen? The water's going to move at such a trickle and move so slowly that what? Okay, mosquitoes. Well, mosquitoes don't arise from just water. But, I mean, bad things. Um, the solids, you know, when you flush the toilet, you're moving waste. And so that waste will settle. The velocity of the water isn't fast enough to scour the pipe. They call it like a self-scouring velocity. Then there can be sedimentation. And so if it, it can be sand, grit, it could be organic wastes, food particles, grease, all those things that are in the sewer will settle to the bottom of the pipe and they get kind of gloopy and coagulated and sticky and so that when the water comes tomorrow it flows over the top of that and so over time it can actually get all gunked up and so yeah there is sort of a minimum velocity that you want to try and hit so that at least once a day you're scouring that pipe and making sure that it's self-cleansing. So there can be too rough, and actually too rough means too shallow, low velocities. Uh huh. Yeah. It's um, it's partly because it's easier, but it's mostly because uh, the uh, the difference isn't quite so dramatic as it will be here. Um, you know, when you've got a, a channel that is sometimes this deep and other times that deep, mm, the difference between, uh, you know, the wetted perimeters and areas aren't as drastic as a pipe that may go just a, a fraction deep all the way to full. Um, I guess it's less important in uh, rectangular and... Um, trapezoidal channels than it is for this because the, the range of flow velocities. But even if you have an open channel, if you expect really high changes in flow velocities, you can apply the same principles and correct for the end value. Okay, so this figure is important. This is both a figure and an example. So um, back to the question of, you know, like what's the best flow, what's the best depth for flow rate? Let's look at this curve here, Q versus Q full. So what we're going to be looking at is on this axis is the depth relative to the diameter. And so when you're at 1.0, that means the water depth is all the way to the top of the pipe. That means the depth and the diameter of the pipe are the same. And then along this x-axis, we're looking at the relationship between the flow of the pipe and the flow of the pipe when it's full. And so as we'd expect, when the pipe is all the way full, then the ratio of Q to Q full is 1. So that's this Q to Q full figure. But it goes up. So when it's like 95% full, so here where Y to YD is 0.95, if you look over, you can see that actually that's greater than 1. You can carry more flow capacity when the pipe is a little bit less full than all the way to the top. Kind of interesting. But what this curve shows is that you could solve Manning's equation, you know, pretend that the pipe is all the way full, and then you can correct for your final answer with this nomograph. Or the other approach is here's the ratio of n values as a function of depth. And so what this is showing is now the end value you follow along the uh, vertical, the axis on top, the horizontal axis on the top of the figure. And so this is showing that when the pipe is 30% full, then the end value is about 1.27 times as much as when it's all the way full. And it's kind of interesting that you'd think maybe the end to end value would keep going up but actually it goes back down to, uh, to 1.0 towards the bottom there. So sort of the worst case scenario is when the pipe is about 30% full, that's when you're going to have the worst relationship between the end value and the end value of the pipe when it's full. 
So in this example we're going to take a look at, we've got a 24 inch diameter pipe and we know the depth is 9 inches. It's laid out on a slope, a, a pipe slope of 0.5 percent. So what is going to be the flow rate of that pipe? We're going to uh, solve it both ways, the angle method as I'll call it and the table method. And I'll be interested to know if the calculators can solve for, uh, for the angles the way that we're going to need to. Um, okay, so this first approach, the angle method, we've got uh, the flow rate unknown. We've got a 24 inch diameter pipe. The flow depth Y or H is 9 inches. And uh, the end value when the pipe is full, what the manufacturer tells us is that the end value is 0 0.013. And the pipe slope is 0 0.005. And we're assuming uniform flow here. So actually, S0 equals SW equals uh, SF. All three of those slopes are parallel to each other. The end value? Well, I say it's concrete. That's the most common end value for concrete. So even though we're in a pipe, the, all three of the slopes are going to each other? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Uniform flow. Okay, so the angle method says that we can solve for the angle theta. It's 2 cosine to the negative 1, the inverse cosine of 1 minus 2 y to d. And so on these calculators, do you have cosine to the negative 1 power? Yeah. Yeah. A cos is what it's called on mine. Yet you've got it there. All right. So we are going to do 2 times the cosine to the negative 1 of 1 minus 2, 9 to 24. Okay, so in other words, that is 2 times the inverse cosine of 0 0.25. Okay. So we get the angle there is 2.636 radians. All right, and that's, so far that makes sense to us because if the pipe was halfway full, how many radians should we get if the pipe is half full? What would be the angle of this in radians if, if it was, you know, we've got a 24 inch pipe here. What if the depth was 12 inches? Well, then it should be pi radians, right? And so this is less than that, and we know it's less than halfway full, 9 inches out of 24. So things are looking good so far. Okay, we can find the cross-sectional area here, d squared divided by 8 theta minus sine of theta. And so the 2 feet diameter squared divided by 8 and then 2.636 radians minus the sine of 2.636 radians. That just seems weird to me, having the angle minus the sine of the angle and having that mean anything, but it does. Uh, we get um, 0 0.5 times 2.636 minus 0 0.484. So that works out to be the cross-sectional area is 1.076 square feet. And we'll find the wetted perimeter. Diameter divided by 2 times the angle in radians. So it's a two foot diameter pipe divided by two and the angle is 2.636 radians. Okay, so we've got 2.636 feet 
is the wetted perimeter. Okay, so to find the, uh, the flow rate that this pipe is currently carrying, we do 1.49 divided by N, area to the 5 thirds power, wetted perimeter to the 2 thirds power, and slope to the 1 half. 1.49 is thrown in here because we're working with traditional units rather than with SI units. And remember that you have to include that as a units conversion factor. Now the N value that we're going to use is the corrected N value. So I said for a concrete pipe, let's assume that the full N value is 0 0.013. Now what's the ratio of our diameter to the flow depth? We have, it's not full. We've got Y to D is 9 to 24, that is 0 0.375. So on the screen here, let's find out when we've got a depth to diameter of 0.375, what N value, what N to N full should we use? So, okay, 375, here's 3, and here's 4, so 0.375 is going to be up there, and we go over and find where it intersects, and then we go up, and it's exactly 1.28, as you can see. It's very clearly 1.28, right? That was my best guess, was 1.28. A reasonable person might assume something different. So I looked at, along the top there, N to N full is 1.28. So what that means is that the N value I'm going to use when I solve my Manning's equation is 0 0.013, and then I'm going to multiply it by 1.28, and I'm going to use 0 0.01664 as my N value when the water depth is down to uh, 9 inches. So. What we've actually got is it's nine inches deep, and so I needed to find a different end value, and that's the point one six six four. Any questions with how I did that, how I found the end value? Mm-hmm. We know the depth to diameter, if you look here on the vertical axis, y to d, on the board, we found that Y to D was 0.375. So I, I find along this axis, where's 0.375? It's, here's 0.3, so 0.375 is there. I go over and intercept the N value curve, and then go up from that, and it is somewhere between 1.2 and 1.3. Three, and I say it's 1.28. I thought it was 8 tenths of the way between here and there. 1.28. Okay, so, now substituting numbers in here to Manning's equation. We're going to say 1.49 divided by this n value we've just found, 0.01664. And then the area, 1.076 feet squared to the 5 thirds power, and 2.636 feet to the 2 thirds power, and finally the slope, the 1 half power. And what we get out of that is that the flow rate will be 3.75 cubic feet per second when the depth is 9 inches. That is what we call the angle method to finding the flow rate. The table method, using, I guess I should call it the figure method, because this is a figure, not a table. But, um, the figure method, we're going to use the Q to Q full line. 
We'll solve for what would be the flow rate when the pipe is full, and then we'll just multiply it by the ratio of Q to Q full. So if the pipe was full, like if the water was all the way up to the top, then we just do 1.49 divided by the end value, 0.013. And we don't have to convert the end value if the pipe's all the way full, because that's the end value the manufacturer gave us, is assuming that the pipe is full. Um, what's the cross-sectional area if the pipe is full? If the pipe is full, then the cross-sectional area is pi d squared divided by 4. And so it is 3.14159 square feet because our diameter is 2. So 2 squared is 4 divided by 4 times pi. So that's the area of the pipe as it's full. Uh, anybody remember when a pipe, a circular pipe, what's the hydraulic radius of a circular pipe? Remember, hydraulic radius is area divided by what a perimeter? D over 4. Right, because it's pi d squared divided by 4, and then wetted perimeter is just pi d. And so we cancel out the pi d, d over 4. So hydraulic radius, d over 4. Okay, so um, Manning's equation was area times hydraulic radius to the two-thirds slope to the one-half. I've written a little differently here than I did here because here I said area to the five-thirds and wetted perimeter to the two-thirds. Well, that's the same thing as saying area times hydraulic radius to the two-thirds. That's the same. I've just written it this way over here because I can calculate the radius so easily this way. Might as well have it out separate. All right, so 1.49, 0.013. The area is 3.14 square feet. The hydraulic radius of D over 4, 2 feet is the diameter, divided by 4 to the 2 thirds power. And then the channel slope to the 1 half power. Okay, so if the pipe was full, the Q full would be 16.04 cubic feet per second. So what about if the pipe is 9 24 full, as is described in the problem statement, if it's 9 inches deep instead of 24 inches deep? Well, we use the figure again. We simply say the depth to diameter again is that same 0 0.375, 9 to 24 is 0 0.375. So I'm going to go over and this time I'm going to go to the curve that says Q to Q full. So it's this curve. Okay, so 0 0.375 intercept this curve and down. Okay, and so I look for the crossing there. It looks like 0.24. So Q to Q full was 0 0.24. So if I want to find Q, then it's Q full times 0 0.24. And we found that Q full was 16.04 cubic feet per second times 0 0.24. And we get 3.85 cubic feet per second if we use the uh, figure method. That's pretty close to this one over here. 3.75 versus 3.85. That is only 2.7% difference between the two of them. So, you know, considering that we were reading numbers off of a figure, using a mouse cursor, 2.75% is fine. <coughs> Neither, because both of them required us to look off the figure. 
So you're either going to have to find some relationship between the n to n full or the q to q full. I'm sure somebody has digitized this and has it in, you know, 1% increments, you know, as, as numbers rather than, um, yeah, so and that's probably out there somewhere. All right, so that was analysis. Analysis is, you know, what's the relationship between flow depth and flow rate design is taking that one step further. It's saying, how big should the pipe be if we know what the flow rate has to be carried is? And so the sewer design procedure, ordinarily, I'll solve problems like this using Excel. And if you rearrange Manning's equation, you know, here's Manning's equation as we've seen it before. If you rearrange Manning's equation in a circular pipe where the area is pi d squared divided by 4, then here is Manning's equation to solve for the diameter. Now, if you put in your flow rate and the end value and the slope into this, then you're going to find the diameter um, in a pipe size that probably doesn't exist. And so you have to round up to the nearest actual pipe size. Always round up, not round down. Um, you still have to account for the end value not being you know, that the n value in this expression is the n full. Yeah, that's about the full value. Right, exactly. And so it's an iterative process a little bit because you'll find the diameter of the pipe and then you're going to find out, well, what would be the depth of the flow for the pipe diameter that you size? And then you have to adjust your n value again because uh, your original iteration was assuming the full pipe n value. So. The reason why I solve this in Excel is that I can put these constants into the right-hand side of an equation, and then I play around for trying to solve what is the angle theta that makes this expression true, because the area is going to be a function of theta, and the uh, wetted perimeter, which goes into hydraulic radius, is going to be the, as a function of theta. So you can do goal seek, or you can manually iterate. Um, and so once you know what the angle with the water surface to the center of the pipe is, theta in radians, then you can solve for what's the depth. And then, remember, we talked about the problem of sedimentation. And um, so you want to analyze, if you, if you size your pipe based on this at max flow, and the pipe has to be large enough to convey the maximum flow that's going to happen during the uh, design life. We'll now take a look at what happens during the middle of the night when there's very little flow. What you'd like to see is that the velocity is greater than two feet per second in order to promote self-cleansing and avoid sedimentation. Um, sometimes there's simply no way to get around the fact that the velocity be less than that. And in the pipes that you analyze and identify the velocity is going to be less than two feet per second, that's where you make a note and ensure that the maintenance department goes through and scours the pipe regularly so that the uh, capacity doesn't get reduced by sedimentation. Here's a picture of a uh, pipe that's full of grease. Those are always nice to look at, a, gre a greasy pipe. Thankfully, it's in black and white. That makes it a little more clinical and less disgusting. But, you know, restaurants are particularly bad, even with the grease traps that they're required by almost all codes to have in place. Um, restaurants are sources of a grease discharge into wastewater plants, and, um, and so the pipes need special attention downstream of the restaurant district. Yeah, a grinder. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? No, I didn't see that. I've actually been to the grinder room, though. That you know, as you walk around a wastewater treatment plant, there's a variety of smells, and the the, the grinder and bar bar screen is the worst one, by far. 
Well, uh, we're going to have to talk about hydrogen sulfide uh, next time, which throws a monkey in the room. Hmm. All right. The part that talks about BOD and risk of hydrogen sulfide formation, cross that off of your homework assignment. You can still find the flow rate for the pipe slope that's given, but you won't be doing the BOD hydrogen sulfide part of that for the homework that's due in uh, 22 hours and 15 minutes. No, no, not 22. Two days, 48 hours minus 75 minutes. All right. So we'll talk about hydrogen sulfide when we get together on Thursday.